on this webinar and this recordings will be made available to you later and uh, this is now for the attendees so we would like to inform you that we will have some time at the end for question and answer session like at the end of every session so we request you to use the q a feature that is available to you to submit your questions and our moderators, they would ensure that your queries are addressed. So I thank you for your kind attention. And now I would like to, as per the agenda, I would like to request Dr. Zhang to kindly deliver the welcome address. I'm there, I'm there. Hello, we can't hear. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome uh, from Korea. Warm greetings to each one of you, esteemed speakers, distinguished panel members, and dear participants. It brings me Great pleasure to extend a heartfelt welcome to our webinar titled Intercountry Knowledge Sharing Webinar on the Biosafety Related Target 17 of the Global Biodiversity Framework. Today, one common interest that has brought us together on this virtual gathering is our shared interest in the biosafety related aspects of Target 17 for the global biodiversity conservation in the context of this recently adopted global biodiversity framework under the Convention on Biological Diversity. I would like to express my gratitude to our esteemed speakers and panelists who have accepted our invitation to share their invaluable experiences and expertise with us. We appreciate your contributions and look forward to learning from you. We would like to thank Dr. Alex Usbini, United Nations Environment Program, and Dr. Viva Ahusa, Biotech Consortium India Limited, BCIL, for agreeing to be the moderators for the technical sessions. Our initiative has received an overwhelming response with over 600, exactly 670, yeah, when I saw this morning, registrations and participants from more than 41 countries. Participants belong to diverse sectors, including government departments, international organizations, research institutions, universities, the private sector, NGOs, and civil society organizations involved in biodiversity conservation, biotechnology, and biosafety. This turnout highlights the current interest to understand the link interlinkages between biosafety, target 17, and biodiversity conservation agendas. This webinar is a collaborative effort between the Korea Institute for Promoting Asia Biosafety Cooperation, KIPABI, and Biotech Consortium India Limited, BCIL, with invaluable support from UNEP Jeff through a multi-country capacity building project and support 
of four participating countries, Bangladesh, India, Mongolia, and the Philippines. Such collaborations symbolize our collecti collective dedication to advancing biosafety and biodiversity conservation agendas at a global scale. Kipabit is committed to providing capacity building support to countries, primarily in Asia, but also open to other collaborations. We hope that through this webinar, we can contribute towards promoting the implementation of Target 17. While significant progress has been made in implementing the content protocol on biosafety, it's imperative to strengthen its implementation to keep pace with rapid advancements in modern biotechnology tools. Although many countries have established legal and administrative measures to fulfill their obligations, but there remains a crucial need to sustain capacities for regulation and biosafety management. This includes enhancing capabilities for comprehensive risk assessment, robust monitoring, and effective management strategies. As we align with the global movement to conserve and restore biodiversity by 2050, it's crucial to integrate biosafety considerations into biodiversity con conservation efforts. This presents an opportune moment to integrate biosafety requirements with national biosafety uh, biodiversity strategies and action plans, and BSAPs, ensuring a holistic and cohesive approach to biodiversity conservation. From my personal opinion, I feel there is a general misperception that the protocol on biosafety sometimes appears less connected to biodiversity conservation compared to the NAWA protocol on ABS. This perception may stem from the biosafety protocol's focus on handling LMOs from modern biotechnology, well as the NAWA protocol centers on equitable benefit sharing from genetic resources. But uh, I know it is crucial to recognize the intrinsic link between biosafety and biodiversity conservation, especially given the complexities arising from rapid biotechnological advancements. As we are now seeing, in the emergence of synthetic biology. In conclusion, as biosafety is a transboundary issue, transcending national boundaries, it is imperative to strengthen national capacities and engage in inter-country collaborative activities to effectively address these global challenges. Integrating biosafety considerations into Biodiversity conservation efforts is essential for a holistic approach to sustainable development and to fulfill the global 2050 vision and 2030 mission. Once again, I extend a warm welcome to the speakers, panelists, and all participants. And I encourage you to actively engage with our esteemed speakers. I wish us a successful engaging and informative webinar. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Zhang. Now, as part of the agenda, I would like to request Dr. Riba, our moderator for session number one, session one on introductions and overviews, overview on GBF. So Dr. Riba Ahuja, the Chief General Manager of Biotech Consortium India Limited, one of our co-organizers. So it is the floor is yours, Dr. Riba. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tashi. And uh, thanks to Dr. Jank for, uh, first of all, uh, you know, steering this uh, 
idea of holding this webinar. As he rightly said, you know, biosafety is many times not so much engaged and there is a little less clarity among the biosafety stakeholders that how they are connected with the NBSAP. Uh, so thank you, sir, for a very nice warm ad welcome address and giving an introduction to the whole webinar. So as you uh, uh, as you all know that this uh, from the program that we have two technical sessions. The first one is introductions and overview on the global biodiversity framework. So we are very uh, pleased that you know we have very esteemed speakers from UNEP and the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity who agreed to uh, introduce the protocol, the GBF fund expectations, and the complete uh, you know the 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 information, the up-to-date information about the uh, the global biodiversity framework. But before I invite Dr. Alex, we have a short presentation by uh, Dr. Tashi, Ms. Tashi, uh, on the multi-country project that Dr. Jang referred to, and under this project, under which we are doing this activity, and also a little more introduction on what exactly are we looking forward as the objectives of the webinar. So over to you, Tashi. So 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vipa. I will share the screen. Okay, so you know, I hope you can see the screen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vibha. If I may broadly um, share the objective of this webinar, this is to bring on board experts like the ones we see now. We have 172 people and I believe more will join us to bring on experts and stakeholders, bring them together to share insights and experiences on integrating biosafety considerations in the National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans, NBSAP. We believe that right now it is an opportune time to discuss this as the countries are currently in the process of revising or updating their NBSABs. The more, the more, can maybe shut close it. The more specific objectives are to introduce. See, your slides are not moving. Yeah, now I'll move. Okay. Yeah. So this this one, this, these are the specific objectives. So firstly, it is to introduce the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and the COP decisions. That is the implementation plan for the Katayana Protocol on Biosafety and the capacity building plan and sharing how these plans actually complement the GBF so that we can understand more on the expectations related to the target 17 to strengthen by safety measures and capacities for the implementation. And ultimately, we can also understand the, the linkage to biodiversity uh, conservation. So for this, we are, we are happy that we have experts from UNEP and CBD. And the other objective is we also wish to share updates on the potential funding windows for biosafety capacity building support, including GBF fund, the Jeff Trust fund, regional and national funding options. And the third one, it's uh, because NBSAP are the main, it's the national NB, national biodiversity strategy and action plans are the main vehicle or instrument for implementing the Convention on Biological Diversity and its protocols at the national level. We believe that facilitating sharing of experiences and insights related to revision of NBSAPs would help us integrate the biosafety related target 17 and help towards ensuring sustainable use and conservation of the biological diversity. And taking opportunity, because this is the first uh, initiative of the project, we would like to share an update on the, briefly on the Jeff project ID 10991 on promoting the safe application of biotechnology through multi-country cooperation 
in the implementation of national biosafety frameworks in Asia. So this is the project overview. This is the title. It's all on strengthening the national biosafety frameworks. And the objective of the project is to strengthen institutional, human and regulatory capacities and promote cooperative measures in the implementation of the NBF's national biosafety frameworks for the safe transfer, handling and use of LMOs in Asia. So initially this project, we, we reached out to make it inclusive for many countries in Asia, but during the JEF project preparation and securing the fund, we could receive for four countries, Bangladesh, India, Mongolia and Philippines. And the, the total project cost is uh, we have USD 1, 1.09 from Jeff Trust Fund. And no. there is co-finance support of USD 5.15 million mm -hmm. from the four countries. And there is additional co-finance from the government of the Republic of Korea. In this case, represented by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy called MOTI. Okay. And, <clears throat> and uh, in this project, UNEP is the Jeff agency and UNEP is providing us with the technical supervision and keep up big. We are the lead executing agency and we are providing us technical services as the multi-country project management unit to UNEP and the four countries. And the project is for 36 months. It will be from this year until the end of 2026. And there are yeah, and there are several activities under this project. I'll not go into details, but we have four main components and we have four major outcomes. So it is all towards strengthening the capacities of the relevant regulatory institutions, the stakeholders involved in strengthening biosafety so that they can promote the safe management of biotechnological products. And ultimately, if you see the goal of this project in green, the, the topmost, it's biological diversity in the participating countries adequately protected from the potential, potential adverse effects of GMOs. So it's all about safe and sustainable use of biological diversity in the end. And um, Though the, the project is exclusive to the four countries, there will be opportunity for the, the interested countries to participate in the activities that are specific to your interests. So that option will be there and we would reach out to you ourselves through the four countries and through BCIL to collaborate and network on it. And just taking advantage of this platform, if I may quickly share about Kipavik, so we are an independent not-for-profit organization and we support basically, I believe you would have heard of Asia Biosafety Family. So it's a community of countries. So we help each other towards fulfilling the common goal of ensuring full compliance to Katena Protocol. And we actively engage in capacity building initiatives to promote regional networking and cooperation in biosafety. So we look forward to engaging more and uh, collaborating with you all. Thank you for your attention. Back to you, Doctor. Thank you so much, Tashi, for giving a brief overview of the project and uh, the webinar objectives. We really look forward to many more activities under this project in a collaborative manner. And so we have next uh, uh, presentation from Dr. Alex Ovosubaini, Global Biosafety Portfolio Manager, Ecosystems Division, UNEP uh, from Nairobi. So, uh, I mean, to the biosafety fraternity, actually, Alex doesn't need any introduction because he is, he is helping every virtually every country in the capacity building activities. And, you know, we, we always depend on Alex for the advice for moving forward and so on. So, uh, today, Alex will talk, tell us about this KMGBF framework and also the expectations from the target team. Over to you, Alex. And thank you so much for... Uh, making your time available. We know Alex is very busy all the time and it is so difficult to reach out to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Viva Ahuja. 
Uh, greetings from Nandi, Fiji. Well, it is evening. So good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Um, I've been asked to give an overview of the coming Montreal framework and just give a flavor of potential linkage to target 17 and also highlight um, potential funding mechanism support um, within 20 minutes. So I'll just give highlights. Hopefully from your questions, I'll be able to respond further. I see the other colleagues on the panel having a uh, word from the Secretariat who would then also if need be coming if I do not have current knowledge, but I'll do the best I can. I hope you can still hear me. Can yes, you hear me? Very much, very much, very much. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good, good. Okay, so um Tashi, do I have access to share screen? Yes, you do. Yes. Okay, that's good. Um just a moment. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, Alex, we can see. Make it please slide show. Yes, that's what I'm trying to do now. Is it okay yes. now? Perfect, perfect. Okay. okay, good. Yes, so this was the topic that I was giving. And uh, uh, it's an overview, so I'll give highlights. I must also confirm that the thoughts are not coming from me alone. Uh, the CBD has done some branded uh, presentations, so quite a lot of it is also reflecting from colleagues in the CBD, knowing that as a secretariat, this is part of the obligations. So uh, I will start on that point. Now, the CBD has rebranded the Kumin, or have branded the Kumin Montreal Protocol as the Biodiversity Plan. So, um, when you hear the biodiversity plan, it's just talking about the KMGBF. I've hyperlinked this globe to the GBF information. So when you click on that globe, all the information you need about the GBF, the mission, the goals, decisions, and some of the toolkit will be available to you so that you can follow up if you want further information. On this, I believe um, Tashi will share a presentation after. This is public knowledge, so I do not hold intellectual property, and you can use it as so fit for your own internal discussions. Now, at the this the genesis of this framework was part of it was from the ministry that was held in Kunming, and it was highlighted that there was a rapid loss of biodiversity, which could impact on get, achieving the SDGs. And that crisis loss is not only on biodiversity loss, but, but climate change and pollution, which could pose a threat to mankind. So the need for a framework that can allow or help member states and the rest of us to be able to address issue was raised. Unfortunately, it fell in the time when the CBD strategy which had IQ targets was ending in 2020. So the process started. Of course, because of COVID, there was a lot of delays. But at the end of 2022, this framework was finally evolved. So that's the quick background. Why is my screen not going? Okay. Okay. So um, if you look at the framework, and uh, if you have time later, you can look at the link and take your time to go. I believe most people have actually assessed this information, but the vision was guided by the 250 mission of living in harmony with nature by 250. There are four goals under the framework. One is to protect and restore. The other is to prosper with nature as a summary. 
And the third is on sharing benefits fairly. And the fourth is more of action of investing and collaborating. Now the GBF has 23 targets. And its mission is to take urgent action as reflecting from the Biodiversity Summit in 2020 in New York. It was to take is the mission is to take urgent action to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. So that sets the scene for set this set the scene for the GBF negotiations and final decision. Now, as I said, there are 23 targets. I won't go over all the targets. I will zoom in mainly to the target 17, which is the object of this discussion. Now, the GBF has further been categorized into three main pillars. One is on implementation and support mechanisms. Two is on monitoring, reporting, and review. And the third is communication letting the world know and also educating ourselves on the GBF. Of course, like most strategies, there are cross-cutting issues that has to be addressed. So in summary, that's the GBF. Okay, so I mentioned it and I'm not going to details, but some people believe that the biosafety would fit more of uh, there's a debatable, but people think it will fit more in goal B. There was no direct linkage to any goal in the framework, but because of sustainable use of biological resources and possible positive or negative impacts of biodiversity, uh, people tend to think that it will fit more because biotechnology can contribute to people also in terms of value, in terms of products and other things. And if it's used well, it will sustainably help to manage biodiversity and the environment. But that's how, if, if we had time, we would have done an exercise to see whether there could be a way to link properly the goals. But that is not at the trust of our discussions. So as I said, the first cluster, uh, the, the, the cluster of targets, which is which will help us to be able to achieve and direct implementation is the 2030 targets, which is on reducing stress to biodiversity. So most of the targets relate to that, but um, I don't think I will spend too much time on this. Now, the second is on, the second is on meeting people's needs and uh, these are targets 9, 10, 11, 12. I will not spend too much time on that also. The third cluster is tools. Sorry, sorry. Is tools. I'm not too sure, okay. Okay, so the, the, the third cluster is on tools and solutions. And um, one of the critical things was on harmful incentives. So there have been discussions on some global commitment on allocation of resources to direct that. Now, the critical one for our discussion is on biosafety, which in summary is to strengthen biosafety and distribute benefits of biotechnology, of course, ensuring and managing any potential risk. Now, these two targets, yeah, there was also discussion to have special capacity building plans towards it, which my colleague Wazi, I believe, would handle. So there's an, a specific implementation plan and capacity building plan for the Catalina Protocol on Biosafety. And also there's a, there's a plan, work on a plan for access and benefit sharing. I've highlighted the DSI because it was not finalized at the last call. 
is still an element in discussion. And even in the development of the Global Biodiversity Framework Fund, two scenarios have been developed. One was that if an agreement came quickly, they could add it to the process as is. But if the negotiators decide to have <clears throat> a different funding mechanism for DSI, that would be a different discussion. So there are two scenarios that could come either with the GBF or without the GBF. So you may have to watch the space, prepare and contribute to those discussions. The last, the, the other sets are tools and means for implementation. So resources come in, capacity building and knowledge sharing. And unlike previous strategies, there's a specific target on gender responsive actions. And of course, participation and access to justice. So these are the targets. And this last set, sets are supposed to assist all of us to engage and ensure that there's an all hands approach in the, on the framework. Now, there are cross cutting considerations, uh, value systems, human rights based approaches, access to clean and healthy environment. One health, I know one country like for example, Liberia, one crit health is a critical issue. So even though it's not coming clear in the terms of national targets, they would want to develop a target on one health. The, the role and issues of indigenous people, of course, gender equality, equality and empowerment, and something that we always we tend to overlook, intergenerational equity. We are supposed to keep the resources we have and manage it for the future of our youth, our children, and our grandchildren. So these are considerations. And the idea is that this framework will contribute to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and to progress towards the SDGs in terms of enabling conditions so that we can achieve the goals and targets. To facilitate the work in terms of the implementation of GBF, there were other decisions that were made at the COP, including a monitoring framework to which some work has been done and additional work is ongoing led by UNEP WCMC working with the CBD and other partners. Decision 56 is on planning, reporting, monitoring review. This is where your MB subs would fit, and the MB staff is supposed to be the critical driver that will, if one is evolved, will help in implementation of the framework. And that is where you engage in terms of responses on target 17. In the last strategy with IG targets, there was no target for biosafety. Therefore, it was difficult for capacity building institutions to develop proposals with governments and member states because we take the Jeff as an example. They always want to see the linkages to a biodiversity strategy or plan, and there was none. So this is an opportunity for member states, for parties, and even non-state actors to work on target 17 to ensure that biosafety is captured in the MBSAP and is mainstreamed into the processes. And there's resource mobilization, there's capacity building, there's the DSI an agenda action plan. I uh, provide a link to the so you can look at it. Now, this plan, as we said, is for the life on Earth, would have national targets which are supposed to be submitted with the MB SAPs be but before COP15, or at least the national targets might, must be submitted by COP16 and give reasons why the MB SAPs may not be ready. This will help get actions on the ground for implementation of the GBF. We already lost four years, so there's need for rapid action. We are in a meeting with the Pacific countries. Most are pledging that by August, at least their national targets will be submitted. And I hope those keep listening also, you would work and engage because if you don't engage now and the targets are submitted, you might have lost part of the momentum. So it's very important. And of course, through the core processes, this will be monitored and reviewed. 
Now, the UN system itself during the negotiations on the framework pledged a UN wide approach to support. So, one area where we would help would be the MBSA forum, where we will share knowledge, committee of practice, and tools available. Um, I'll resend the presentation to Tashi with a link for those who have not accessed the MBSA uh, forum before. The Germany and Colombia are also leading a process called MBSAP Accelerator, working with CBD, UNEP, and UNDP. That will give money mainly for implementation of the framework. And it will have some countries involved as they make the request and some of the some other regional initiatives. And the main focus. Um, is to assist us to accelerate MB SAP implementation. There's a human going common approach. And uh, if you are in the in, at the country level, you see that now the UN resident or country reps are periodically asking agencies for <laughs> status of implementation of the GBF. So the UN country teams with direction from the top are actively finding ways to ensure that we do not duplicate efforts at the national level, but we work to revise, update MBSAPs, and have clear implementation plans, capacity building plans, gender plans, resource mobilization plans, to be able to work together for life on Earth. And as I said, UNDP and UNEP are leading the MBSAP update processes. FAO has pledged to help with the agriculture part of the process, agro-food systems, to ensure that we do not leave out anything. The other MEAs have also pledged, there's another, another discussion going through the burn process to ensure that their discussions also contribute and syncs with the GBF as not only a CBD instrument, but a global instrument. So as I have highlighted, the monitoring framework is ongoing. The review process will be country specific and global. I believe by the seventh national report in 2026, a voluntary peer review mechanism will be opened up for further actions. Now for resource mobilization, as you all know, the Jeff Trust Fund, the Jeff is the financing mechanism for not only the convention, but the two protocols. So the Jeff in every Jeff cycle, which is for four year cycles, makes allocation available to what they call focal area allocations. Biosafety and ABS are under the biodiversity focal area allocation. And there are three objectives under the biodiversity focal area. The ones critical for this are objective two and three. Objective two is on implementation of the biosafety and the Nagoya protocol. Objective three is on domestic mobilization of resources. So the countries are supposed to put some of their money into these issues. As per the COP discussions, and as I showed by the decisions that were made, there was a request for a dedicated fund to support implementation of the GBF called the GBF or Global Balancing Framework Fund which was to be operationalized as soon as possible. It was to be transparent and flexible. Through August 2023 to by December, it had been council, the GBF council had approved it and it's gone operational February this year fully. And the first call is being made for submission of project preparation grant requests. Maybe when you ask questions, I can go a bit into it. And um, the what the, GF, the, the GBF Council decided is that even though there are pledges being made, they will not wait for all the pledges to come. So funds are being released in tranches. We're in the first tranche, and the request on 14, 27 February for first PPG submission by 1st March, and second by 1st April. It's quite a challenge. Most Agents may not, but then the JF guidance is that for countries that do not use the allocation, 
it can be moved the, the second tranche and added on. So you will not lose the money. I hear there are comments around that if you run, you don't submit, you will lose the funds. It's not totally correct. There's also the China Fund and the Kumin Fund. I do not have much uh, knowledge on it, but it's an additional funding that's supposed to help a special countries in Asia to implement the GBF. Maybe the, some of the participants or discussions would have more knowledge on that. And the GFC, as I said, on the strategic objective three, said beside all this, there's a window for countries to put some money from their star location to develop now a mechanism or plans for domestic resource mobilization. Sometimes there are bonds, there are debt swaps, there are things that are being done which we do not factor in as resources. Such a project could and to complement the MBSAP ongoing work where there's a component on biodiversity finance. You will notice that if you put all the enabling activities for GF7 to now, the GF is given each party at least one million dollars. There was three hundred for the early action support, four fifty for the MBSAP update and uh, national report, sixty thousand for the two protocol reports. Plus the biofin, new biofin project, another 300,000. So the Jeff has pledged at least a million dollars per party to help revise and update the MBSAP and set up plans. And there are several other donors, including philanthropic trusts, who want to be involved in implementing the framework. So the parties will have to dedicate time and resources to even find out what is happening in areas where they will need support. Plus, there may be another additional funding from the DSI process. Uh, because of time, I may not go into it, but I'll provide a link where the JF has provided all the information you need about the Bus Diversity Framework Fund. I will just share two slides on the critical areas. In any activity you are going to do on the GBF Fund, it has to be biodiversity focused, and there are eight action areas that they will fund. Target 17 and Target 17 will be under action area eight, capacity building implementation, implementation support for the biosafety protocol. So these are the areas. If your request for support does not fall within this eight, then it's out of what they can fund. It has to show a clear linkage that it is helping to implement MBSAP. So those things are very critical. You must ensure that there's an IPLC linkage to the process, which was agreed in Cancun anyway at the COP. So they've put in a selection criteria, and one of them is IPLC linkages. The GBF fund has no co-finance requirement. It is basically a direct cash support to the party. And allocations are made to parties. So if you want to have a regional or global project, there's no set aside. The countries have to agree on put money into a common port for that particular activity. You also still have money from your GF uh, uh, trust fund allocation, but there's a special fund only for biodiversity. If it works well, we foresee it growing for years to come. Now they've done the first tranche because they had received 211 million. The Jeff Trust Fund, a trust fund can only be set when you have at least $120 million in hand. So they set up the first tranche. They have got an additional 250 million. So they are going to add additional resources in the last year near Luxembourg and others have pledged another almost $50 million. So as more money comes in, there'll be tranches. Uh, what the GF, GBF Council has decided is that every card will get at least up to a maximum, at least not less than $5 million for the GBF, even if it's in tranches. And they've done a ratio of how to allocate those resources. I may not go into it because I think my time is up. I provided some links and uh, I avail myself for questions. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Alex, for giving such a nice, uh, you know, work. and with so much clarity and overview of the Kunming Montreal uh, Biodiversity Framework and sharing the opportunities for funding uh, these activities. Uh, I think we'll come back to the questions after we hear Ms. Vardnai uh, from okay. the CBD Secretariat. And since we have a question answer session after that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we will now have a presentation. Uh, the next presenter uh, in this webinar is Ms. Vardzanai. Uh, she is the head of the unit of the biosafety in the CBD Secretariat as the Senior Program Management Officer. And presently, uh, she is in Paris, but still she agreed you know, for uh, uh, to be with us in this webinar and share her, her uh, presentation on understanding the implementation plan and the capacity building plan for the Katayna protocol on biosafety. As Alex has said that, you know, the, the um, target seven, to achieve target 17, these are the two important uh, documents and the decisions which have been, uh, which have been agreed and these would form the basis of uh, moving forward. So over to you, Madam, uh, Ms. Vajanai for your presentation. Can you please share your slides? Alex, you have to unshare. I've unshared already. Okay, right. Thank you. Uh, yes, good time of the day uh, to you all. Um, as you know, the Secretariat and UNEP are uh, mother and daughter, um, like the convention and the protocol. Uh, so we have the same background. That's why <laughs> you recognize the biodiversity plan. And um, just to also highlight, um, Target 17, um, while missing from um, the first uh, by the first two biodiversity plans, um, is now in this third biodiversity plan. And um, on this logo are the 23 targets, and uh, Target 17 is very centrally located. Um, so this is. Um, one of the, the elements to remember. And also uh, to remember that when you see this uh, logo of the biodiversity plan and the representation of the 23 targets, um, the target 17 is supposed to be the closest to the color of the protocol as well. Um, so there's some method uh, to, to this logo. But thank you very much um, and good time of the day to you all and thank you for the opportunity uh, to share and participate in this webinar uh, for the Secretariat. Unfortunately, uh, the other colleagues aren't able to participate. Um, it's 3 a.m. in Montreal right now. So basically, uh, just to highlight the process for the development of the implementation plan and the capacity building plan uh, was quite an extensive process. And in the decision in uh, 2018, parties decided that it would be a party driven and inclusive of all stakeholders process. Uh, and the liaison group of the Cartagena protocol was given a new and fresh mandate uh, to really lead um, this process. It was facilitated by the Secretariat and it was an extensive process that comprised of submission of views, several online decisions and discussions and reviews um, by the liaison group. We had a peer review and uh, eventually it was the first biosafety issue that was considered by the subsidiary body on implementation. And um, the liaison group was again um, uh, a key element that contributed uh, to the process and consulted with the co-chairs of the open-ended working group on, on the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. You may also recall that the original version of the Target 17 that was discussed in, in um, the Global Biodiversity Framework came from the input from the liaison group. So the implementation plan is a framework 
of broad desirable achievements and accomplishments and it's been um, highlighted in a way that will address the implementation of the biosafety protocol. Uh, because of the four years that were lost, it is for the period up to 2030. It has a narrative part which addresses the purpose, the linkages, the structure, how the review will be undertaken, the baseline for measuring the priorities and resources. And then the plan itself is presented as a tabular annex containing 14 goals. And these goals have been divided into two components. Um, the first section with 10 substantive goals covers the areas of implementation of the, of the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. And then it also includes a specific goal that looks at the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol. Then the uh, part B are the enabling environment goals. And these are the four cross-cutting goals that are required to support implementation. For each of the goals in the implementation plan, the objectives being the key accomplishments to be achieve the goal and are identified. And these follow the key provisions of the protocol itself, indicators, have been agreed upon, which will be used for each of the objectives and the final outcome for achieving the goal has also been identified. So the implementation plan, while being directed primarily at parties to the protocol, the 173 parties, it also recognizes that non-parties, other stakeholders from different sectors, organizations, Indigenous peoples and local communities and donors are able to support the implementation of the protocol. The areas of implementation, which are the goals, they concern the key elements for the implementation of the protocol. So the first one relates to functional biosafety frameworks, which is a key and primary requirement of the protocol. The second relates as a goal on information sharing through the BCH, the Biosafety Clearinghouse. Again, um, this is taking advantage also of the obligation the parties have to provide information on the BCH to update the details and as well as make use of the newly migrated BCH. The third one is on national reporting and uh, it covers the obligation of parties to report and to report in a timeless manner. The fourth goal is on compliance, and this is a number of elements aimed at enhancing compliance with the protocol. You will recall that um, the protocol has a, a soft compliance mechanism, and the issues of compliance have become quite important in the last few years, and as a result, the GIF uh, window for the current GIF window also makes provision for countries to support implementation of compliance action plans. The next goal is on risk assessment and risk management. Again, it's around providing countries with support to conduct um, risk assessments and again to ensure risk management. The next goal looks at preventing and addressing illegal and unintentional transboundary movements. Again, this is one of the key elements of the protocol and there are a number of objectives outlined in this regard. The next one is handling, transport, packaging and identification requirements. This is based on Article 18 and a number of elements required to enhance this element um, of the protocol. We then have um, a, a, another additional goal on detection and identification. As the protocol has um, continued with implementation, detection and identification have become um, critical elements of the work program of the protocol. 
And um, there are a number of activities and uh, indicators to support detection and identification. The next one is socioeconomic considerations. Again, this has a number of uh, activities that have been identified as part of enhancing decision-making and implementation of the protocol. And finally, um, this plan, unlike the previous plan, includes um, specific goals, not only for parties to the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol on Liability and Redress, but also to increase the number of parties um, to the Cartagena Protocol who become parties to the supplementary protocol as well. As I indicated, um, the implementation plan is in two parts. There are a number of goals related to the enabling environment, and these are the cross-cutting goals, and they provide support to the implementation of the other 10 goals, and these are capacity building, resource mobilization, cooperation, and public awareness, education, and participation. These um, cross-cutting um, enabling environment goals also have objectives, indicators, and desired outcomes identified. So the implementation plan is intended to facilitate the implementation of the Katakana Protocol and it's addressed to parties to the Cartagena Protocol. The Global Biodiversity Framework is addressed to parties to the Convention as a whole. So while the implementation plan is um, anchored in and complementary to the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, it really does apply only to parties to the Biosafety Protocol. And COPMOP therefore recognized the complementarity of the implementation plan to the GBF and that the implementation plan can contribute to achievement of the goals and targets relevant to biosafety in the bigger Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, especially to the parties to the convention that are also parties to the Cartagena Protocol. And we also see um, this will be reflected in the joint reporting that uh, parties to the Cartagena Protocol will be able to use their implementation plan reports um, to support their GBF reporting. Um, the Kunming uh, Global Biodiversity Framework has already been described um, by uh, Alex very well. And I just wanted to um, stress an element on Target 17, um, which in the coming months, uh, parties will continue um, to, to discuss, and which is around uh, Article 8G of the Convention and um, the measures for handling of biotechnology and distribution of its benefits as set out in Article 19. And this is uh, an element which uh, we are all working on. And while we are able to respond uh, better to the biosafety part um, of this target, um, there is some work to be done uh, to unpack the handling of biotechnology, in particular, um, the distribution of its benefits, as this is an element which, uh, as things stand, we don't really have a way to um, measure and develop specific indicators for. So if you have any ideas on how the distribution of the benefits of biotechnology as um, uh, anticipated uh, in Article 8G, uh, uh, we would certainly be having a number of discussions and webinars in the coming months to further unpack this element. Um, then I will just do a brief introduction to the Capacity Building Action Plan, which was adopted in Decision 10.4 of um, COPMOP 10. 
and the purpose of the Capacity Building Action Plan is to facilitate the development and strengthening of the capacities of parties to implement the protocol, and it is complementary to the implementation plan. It uses the same format, it has a narrative and a tabular annex, and it uses the exact same goals as those of the implementation plan. When it comes to the key areas for capacity building, these have been um, highlighted in a non-exhaustive manner and their suggestions for areas for capacity building. There are examples of activities for each area and indicators have been um, uh, highlighted as well as an outcome. The capacity building action plan um, means is, is aimed at facilitating development and strengthening of the capacities of parties to implement the protocol by facilitating the engagement of partners and donors, fostering a coherent and coordinated approach to capacity building, as well as promoting regional and international cooperation and coordination, um, much like this webinar is doing today. And um, as I said, the Capacity Building Action Plan has many indicative elements and it recognizes that capacity building can take place at different levels, at the national, regional and global level, that it involves a range of actors, including providers and recipients of capacity building. The activities that are in the Capacity Building Plan are not prescriptive or exhaustive, but rather they provide uh, an indicative um, framework for further consideration by parties. And they can always be adapted to national circumstances and needs. Again, this plan is anchored in and complementary to the long-term strategic framework for capacity building and development, which was um, adopted by the COP in decision 15A. And um, the last part um, of the package um, is the Kunming Montreal um, Global Biodiversity Framework also established, uh, includes a monitoring framework. And in order to support this mon monitoring framework, an ATIC was established, which has worked um, on indicators. Uh, for target 17, the COP provided a binary indicator, which will be used in national reports. And this has been um, uh, further developed by the ATIC and will also be discussed at the upcoming SUBSTA meeting. And the binary target um, relates to the number of countries with capacities and measures in place related to target 17. And um, that is the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much uh, for your time and for such a nice overview of both the implementation plan and the capacity building plan. Uh, we do read these documents, but you know, this kind of an overview always helps bringing in more clarity and better understanding among the stakeholders. Thank you very much and uh, thank you both to Alex and to yourself for these two presentations. So uh, uh, this is the time for a very quick uh, uh, question and answers. So I can see two questions in the box which I would like to just uh, share with both of you. Of course, the first question doesn't seem to be related, but if you wish to respond, somebody is asking about what is the role of artificial intelligence in handling biosafety? So I think it is slightly out of uh, the topic, but still, if you would like to respond. Um, I, I will um, uh, respond, uh, not directly, um, but just to uh, indicate that we've had a, a complementary process um, with the multidisciplinary ad hoc technical experts group on um, horizon scanning for synthetic biology. And in this process, um, they have highlighted artificial intelligence um, and its applications 
as a key area, um, both for biosafety and for um, uh, biodiversity. And it's one of the areas that has been highlighted for further action under the convention. So um, I don't have a direct okay. answer, Thank but you. it is Thank something you. which um, we've also okay. picked up. All right. Thank you so much. And we have another question from Dr. Aparna. If I may add a point. Yes, uh, please. Uh, yes, please. Okay. The AI would not necessarily impact on decision making. Decision making has to be an iterative process of human thinking. However, some AI tools might help in terms of detection, surveillance, monitoring, and collecting data. That is feasible. AI may also help in product development, but the management aspect of the modern biotechnology products with a set tool to support, it might not be that effective. Finally, also, AI itself is going to go through a regulatory process to have standards such that it's not just used anyhow. So that also is an area of still in discussion which can impact on our safety based on what comes out of that process. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for supplementing. We have a uh, question or a comment actually from Dr. Aparna Islam who has indicated that, of course, uh, the capacity building is an ongoing process and it should continue with the technology. But maybe it is a time to also review uh, the people who have received these trainings which have been going on and evaluate the learnings so that, you know, all that can be built into the modifications in the capacity building activities, etc. So, and Alex or Madam Vajzani, would you like to answer that? I think some evaluation processes which are there or learnings from the capacity building activities. This is what she is looking for. I, th I think um, from our side, uh, we do have a, a, a system in place um, on reviewing um, and we actually have a process underway to review some of the capacity building programs that we have run, um, particularly on risk assessment um, uh, uh, training. And um, I, I think that one of the main, uh, and, and she's right around uh, the evaluations that have been done and also the opportunities that exist um, in developing new programs, uh, learning from uh, those that have been in place before. Uh, built within uh, the protocol is assessment and review. And when we've done the assessments and review, we've just, the last COPMOP um, did the fourth assessment and review. And within the assessment and review, um, we have capacity building elements that are built in. And this is what we used um, in preparing this capacity building action plan. It, mm -hmm. uh, took uh, inputs from the assessment and review, both the third assessment and review and the fourth assessment and review um, of, of the protocol. Thank you. Um, Alex, this is the last question that we will take. Uh, Dr. Richard Goodman has asking that you, is there a- Can I add a point? Yes, Sorry, please. can I add a point yes. to Dr. Yes, Islam, please? please. Yes, please. Um, I, we agree with you, um, Dr. Islam, but as uh, you rightly indicated, I see your question as more of comments also. It is very important that capacity building institutions have an adaptive process to continuously rebuild and re, so to speak, re set themselves up again, have evaluation. If you take the Jeff, all Jeff projects have to go to a terminal evaluation to retro feedback. Wazi has talked about the monitor and review system. One thing that we don't do often is peer review because a lot of capacity building institutions present themselves as they know everything. But I think it's an area that we all need to work on. And also be careful not to profile the trainees because sometimes we tend to then lose out. 
And finally, in the developing world, what I've seen in biotechnology and biosafety is that there's a high turnover. So you tend to continue to do some of the training again and again because governments change, people move. So um, I think that's also one thing we need to look at in terms of how do we tailor make uh, build capacity building to different entities, not one size fit all. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Alex, this is the last question, and I, because you have so much experience in biosafety capacity building projects uh, virtually in you know around the world, so this question comes very often, which Dr. Goodman has said, you know, is there a clear definition of both LMO and GMO? and the description of devitalized GMO or food and feed in all parties. So, uh, of course, we know that there is no, uh, the definition of LMO is part of the Katrina protocol, but any further documentation or clarity, if it is there, would you like to share something? And then maybe we'll move on to the next session. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Goodman, for putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> as Dr. Weber said, Really, LMO is a negotiated test in the negotiation process. The Biosafety Protocol is a compromise document. And based on the definition that the party or sovereign country puts in their law, that becomes an operational element. Of course, if it is to the Biosafety Protocol, most of them will use the definition of LMO. But I've seen laws where they said, in this context, LMO equals GMO. Though there are a bit of differences, especially if you are using chemical radiation and other to modify an organism and other things. But um, I think the important thing is that the, the entity and the biosafety process have a clear cut definition that fits into their law, that allows for, um, outreach that shows that there's been a kind of a movement that causes a modification to the genetic material. I think those are critical. Um, Devitalized GMOs, I'm not too sure what it means, so that I will not be able to respond to. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a series of questions coming up, but I think what I will do is in the interest of time, because we are just uh, still running about seven, eight minutes late, so I'll hand over to Tashi and, you know, uh, for initiating the next session. And then all these questions we can take up later in the, our, uh, you know, towards the end. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tashi. Over to you. And thanks to both my speakers. And it was really wonderful hearing both of you and your the answers to the questions. Over um, to you, thank Tashi. You. Um, thank you very much. I will oh. have to leave, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah. But please um, do share with us the the final outcomes, and we will um, respond to uh, to the questions. And just to that last question um, on the devitalized, <laughs> uh, if you look in the supplementary protocol, there was and um, this element of products uh, thereof, um, and that was a light attempt um, by parties to try and capture um, the devitalized yeah. uh, LMOs. But thank yeah. you very yeah. much and yeah. I wish you all um, a very successful thank webinar. Thank you. Before you leave, you know, I just had one more question which I thought I'll, I will ask myself, you know, and to you and, you know, maybe just a take home thing. We are doing this activity under the regional project, you know, regional multi-country, not exactly regional, but inter-country kind of a project. So, you know, with Alex, of course, we keep on talking and even at earlier CBD decisions, we have seen that there is a very, although we take these decisions in the implementation plan and capacity building plans and so on, that there will be regional, regional cooperation be encouraged and, you know, but there is never a separate funding allocation for these kind of things. So under the new funds or anything, you know, maybe some things of this kind should also be encouraged. And, you know, just for the consideration of both of you, this was just a point I wanted to bring up here. And then, you know, more such initiatives. And of course, we'll hear in the next sessions how these, uh, you know, multi-country pro programs also are very useful. Thank you so much. 
Over to you, Tashi. Thank you, Dr. Weber, for moderating this session in a very excellent way. And thank you to our two speakers for all the insights. Now coming to session number two, it is on mainstreaming of target 17. And we have Dr. Alex of UNEP who would be moderating this. So I hand over the floor to you, Dr. Alex. Thank you for agreeing to moderate this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Tashi. Um, this session is to hear from the countries in terms of what strategies they are putting in place to mainstream biosafety into the MBSAPs. If you look at the disinfectants, the parties are supposed to revise and update the MBSAPs for the convention and its two protocols. We had always had this issue of uh, biosafety being seen as being a silo. I think it's an opportunity for the countries to share their experiences. So, so as not take too much time, I'll call on Mongolia to take the role first, and then we'll follow with the Philippines, I believe, Republic of Korea, India, and then Bangladesh in that order. Thank you. So, um, sorry, it's uh, Mongolia, Philippines, India, Korea, and Bangladesh. So, Mongolia, over to you. But Alex, before that, we had two presentations. Which one is so, that? Doreen and myself, yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought I was doing the last one. Okay. It, it, no, no, it's fine. So let's let's go with Doreen and you. It means that I'm let's getting go. sleepy because of time. Uh, <laughs> not, okay. not sleeping here. So I think uh, my apologies to all of you colleagues for having missed up uh, the agenda. I take the blame. Um, we will go back to capacity building initiatives and contributions from other ongoing activities. And this session will have to present us Dr. Viba Uja, who is from BCL, the Chief General Manager. And then from Africa, there's also a multi-country project that is going on. MS Doreen from Rain Africa will then follow. 10 minutes each. So over to you. Yeah, just one minute. So Viba first and Doreen. Yes, oh, sorry. Just one second, I'll share. Is the slide visible? Is yes, my slide is, visible? Yes, yeah, yes. Visible. In the slide show, no? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we, uh, this, this uh, as Alexa said, that we just want to quickly hear. Some of the biosafety capacity building initiatives, uh, we, when we were structuring this, we thought that we could talk about Asia and Africa both separately. And that's uh, how uh, I have been given the responsibility of sharing some of the initiatives and how they can contribute to the to the decision making and to the you know implementation of the biosafety framework. And I would say the ad advancements and the use of bio biotechnology for the benefit of society. So this is what is the, uh, these initiatives are extremely useful. And uh, just to give you all a brief uh, uh, brief introduction to BCIN, we are actually a company which was promoted in uh, uh, by the Department of Biotechnology Government of India in 1990. And we are a very unique kind of organization with government in advisory capacity, the banks as our funding agency and biotech industry for commercial insights. We do a lot of activities for the translation of biotechnology to the society and one of that is of course compliance with the biosafety and that's how we are actively engaged in this is strengthening the biosafety activities mm -hmm. so we have been working in india and also in uh, the region uh, some other countries supporting uh, 
the activities through implementation of capacity building projects, in fact, supporting the not only the guidelines process, but also supporting the developers in compliance with these technologies. So I'll just take a five, 10 minutes as the time has been allocated to me, uh, just to uh, give an oversight on, you know, how the capacity building is when biosafety is so much essential for, you know, um, for the use of biotechnology and in a safe and sustainable manner. So if we look at the Asian region, you know, it's one of the largest and largest and the most populated continent, continent, in particular South and the Southeast Asia. So we have, it's a very diverse continent compared to the others. We are economically, socially, politically, environmentally, everything is very, very diverse in this region. So the current population is 4.75 billion, which is equivalent to almost 60% of the world population. And as the, in line with the diversity, there is a, in a diverse economies. There is also a diverse experience in the adoption of biotechnology, and so is the varied status in the biosafety uh, requirement. But there are some commonalities, and those commonalities are that in terms of you know developmental index, we have a lot of challenges to meet. There are many key indicators which still demonstrate limited progress. We have a large population which is undernourished. And there are also challenges in healthcare. Now, all this requires the innovative technologies to be used, you know, to meet these challenges. And that's how the advancements in the research has to take place. And modern biotechnology interventions provide us very, very useful interventions, you know, in both agriculture, healthcare, and dealing with these problems, you know. So, and these include what we just heard, genetically modified organisms, also called living modified organisms. And then we have now new technology, gene edited organisms and gene drives. And it goes on, you know, that advancement is moving very fast. But how do we apply these advancements for the benefit of the society? So there comes the biosafety regulations, which are extremely important for benefiting from these technologies. And so is the biosafety capacity building. I wanted to share, share these things because we need to correlate this protocol and other things to our day-to-day -day challenges and how they contribute to, you know, they should not be looked upon as an obstacle, but as a, as a you know, um, system which helps us to provide uh, these developments to the society. So if we look at the biosafety regulatory framework in Asia, we have most countries in South and Southeast Asia, which are signatories to the Katarina Protocol and Biosafety, biosafety regulatory frameworks are in place in most of the countries as a result of being a party to CTD, uh, to the Katarina Protocol. However, there are, uh, there are differential status with respect to the implementation and that is where, you know, we need, uh, we need uh, what you call uh, capacity building. The competent authorities are there to receive the applications, separate laws have been enacted in some and only in very few countries, but otherwise, it is within that system. Biosafety regulations are more inclined for plants and there's a very limited experience in other organisms as we move on. So there are lots of, what I wanted to convey through this was that there is a lot of gaps in the Asian region which need to be, which need to be attended to, to take benefit of all these, uh, you know, technologies and, you know, and uh, taking into account the impact on the biodiversity. So when we talk of capacity building initiatives, they are for effective biosafety regulations. We have to understand that regulating innovations is also a multifaceted and multi-stakeholder endeavor. And it needs a lot of innovations, raise a lot of questions for policymakers and regulators, which would ultimately inform their decisions. This means that we need a very robust biosafety frameworks with a, you know, with the stakeholders, the regulators, all people with a good level of capacity to deal with these advancements. Development of guidelines is a constant process which goes on in most of the countries where the biosafety, biotechnology research and other things are underway. And also at the same time, there is a lot of work which goes on at the international level and internationally accepted methodologies for products of modern biotechnology are in place. And whether that includes, of course, the Convention on Biological Diversity, under which the Secretariat keeps on coming up with the new discussions, new 
new technical series of documents and and the you know other um, uh, things for the particularly focused at the environmental safety then we have the codex and we have who for healthcare products and so on so there are lots of resources available but we need a very robust framework within the country to operationalize and use these documents and for doing that capacity building is the key to implement appropriate regulations and facilitate decision making and hence it is very important that you know it's very nice that the target 17 is a part of the whole nbsap otherwise it it remained sort of sidelined and it was uh, in fact i as i raised we keep on talking about it and read read in the uh, decisions or the documents under cbd also that the funding for the capacity building and other things for biosafety has been quite minimal as compared to the whole uh, whole uh, total percentage of the whole funding as it should be this being a very important protocol and this being a very important consideration so um, i will just take you to some of the examples on how this capacity building can be actually useful in the decision making and also in the you know harmonization at the uh, regional level also so if we look at the capacity building initiatives in asia we've had uh, jeff supported projects which are mainly through unep and there have been multiple series even like in india itself we had uh, three projects there are two which have been completed and third one is about to be initiated malaysia we had two projects bangladesh sri lanka and many countries you know they've had implemented series of now these projects and that's how aparna said that you know why uh, uh, how we should evaluate this and in addition to that we have several other initiatives south asia biosafety program which has been in india and bangladesh i will speak a little about it then asia biosafety clearing house which was an initiative by korea the korea biosafety clearing house Uh, which was uh, abch 23 countries were there and then uh, later on uh, now we they have moved on to this kind of a more intensive projects with multiple objectives and the first one is this multi country project where uh, which tashi introduced to us we have also had another initiative here on project which is the digital harmonization on the safety assessment of foods derived from gm plants where we had uh, india bangladesh bhutan and sri lanka in which bcl was a part of it so i will just uh, share that with you uh, of course you know if i look at the last one which we completed i just want to share two three examples very quickly with you the phase 2 capacity building project on biosafety which we implemented from 2013 to 2017 and it had you know four areas and which were very very much picked up in line with the with the strategic plan on biosafety 2011-20 and we came up with really good uh, outcomes and we have helped the uh, strengthen the capacity in the country we had guidelines for era of ge plants and these are all you know linked to the operationalization or i would say efficient functioning of the regulatory system we came up with monitoring manuals detection labs were strengthened and customs quarantine all these people were strengthened i mean if you link this with the all id uh, the list which uh, uh, madam uh, uh, madam varjana i shared from cbd you could see that you know many of these things were actually contributed to that so this has helped us uh, take certain decisions and also evaluate uh, the products in a more efficient way so then i would i would just share with you the south asia biosafety program this is a program which has been active in india and bangladesh it is implemented by agriculture and food agriculture food systems and institute institute with the presently with the support of gates foundation earlier it was from usaid and we have been working bcil is a part of this uh, being coordinating the activities from india and we have had uh, you know almost uh, 20 years we would be completing for this particular program to be there we have partnered with many international national organizations and covered various aspects field trials food safety environmental safety and biosafety compliance i will take you a minute take a minute of yours to the regulatory harmonization of technical technical requirements where we have been trying to focus on the capacity building programs and where we think that the success can be achieved in terms of the regional harmonization you know if we focus on the conceptual approaches information and data requirements and test protocols you know these are all the tools which help 
the regulators take the decisions and also uh, you know uh, implement the protocol in a very efficient way and one of such a decision such a uh, project that we took up it was it is called south asia harmonization initiative and what we did here was that we we, we had regulators and experts from four countries bangladesh bhutan india and sri lanka wherein they came together and they developed a consensus approach to the gm food safety assessment in line with the codex guidance and then we 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 provided through these groups that together developed identified certain gaps for the effective implementation of the protocol of the uh, biosafety framework and these things were simple things like common application formats recommended information elements and templates for risk assessment summary report i know some of these templates are already available on the protocol site the, especially the assessment summary format but we went a little more beyond that and tried to put in technical uh, technical information and then tailored the activities to meet countries uh, needs and i'm very happy to share that this project you know health countries uh, partners have already either updated their guidelines or they have uh, you know adopted the application forms and things like that so just wanted to convey that you know capacity building programs particularly regional programs also can play a very important positive role in ensuring harmonized information data requirements and one of the examples is you know like you all know that bt brinjal and now bt cotton has also been approved in bangladesh so much of the data for the safety data of that was generated in india and it could be very easily accepted there because we had the similar guidelines that was also one of the factors that you know similar guidelines based on the internationally accepted approaches helped uh, you know uh, this process even better so uh, the second project gave us a learning that regional harmonization at the technical level is also possible and this also would overall you know help in the using the data generated in the countries to region to reduce the cost of you know regulatory requirements and bring the benefits of these technologies see we always perceive cotton in a protocol as a you know tool to to uh, to ensure biosafety but at the same time we have to ensure that the benefits of these advancements of these technologies reach to the society uh, so i just feel that you know there is a just to conclude i just feel that uh, there is a very urgent need to use these tools to meet these challenges which our region and our countries are facing and we need an enabling environment strengthening the biosafety frameworks is very important and experience sharing and resource sharing at the regional level should also be encouraged as part of these capacity building efforts uh, to by by mainstreaming through this and we are very pleased that you know this target has been added and more funds will hopefully flow in for capacity building and we can uh, you know undertake more activities thank you so much thank you very much dr viba we we'll come back with comments after the second presentation um ms dorin over to you thank you thank you very much uh, alex thank you um kibak for inviting us to share our experiences on this platform uh, for us we have partnered in other initiatives before and it is critical to continue this uh, uh, collaboration collaboration and for us to continue learning from each other so we are grateful for the invitation and i will be sharing with uh, the listeners an experience from um, a lead executive agent of biosafety uh, projects in southern africa um i hope i can share my screen i should apologize that uh, i am not able to use my camera and i hope you can imagine how i look like <laughs> yes uh, can you see my screen Hello? yes 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 yes, yes. 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 if you can go to slide show yes i'm doing that now
Thank you. So I am from a regional uh, initiative. It's called Rain Africa, which stands for Regional Agricultural Environmental Innovations Africa. We are a non-governmental organization working in Southern Africa. Um, we envision a continent where stakeholders have access to innovative technologies, uh, as well as benefit from them uh, in a manner that ensures um, safeguarding of the natural resources and ecosystem. And this is how we found ourselves working in the biosafety uh, space. We mostly work with need-driven projects. So we work with, uh, we address the needs and bridge the gaps identified by our partners across uh, local, national, and regional tiers. And uh, we are guided mainly by gaps that are common gaps that would have been identified across a number of countries that we work with for us to initiate projects at regional level. We also work on uh, actively fostering collaboration to facilitate exchange of experiences, insights, and enhance capacities in thematic domains that we work in. We have been in the biosafety space since 2001 as a regional network. And below are some of the activities, or rather the activities that were dedicated to capacity building on biosafety. We had a gaps and needs assessment in biotechnology and biosafety in East and Southern Africa. The first two phases were funded by the DGIS of the Netherlands. We also had a, a project that was looking at environment, uh, including capacity building on access and benefit sharing issues. We had an innovation project looking at sustainable development and poverty reduction, uh, through which we formed, um, or rather through which our partners formed a Southern African GM detection uh, network. And then um, from there, we engaged with, at UNEP, uh, with UNEP to implement GEF funded projects. So you see that from one to three, we were funded by mainly by the Netherlands uh, uh, through the DGIS and also Ministry of uh, Housing uh, in, in the Netherlands, Housing and Sustainable Development in the Netherlands. So in 2013, we were uh, approached by our partners in Southern Africa to initiate a needs assessment on LMO detection capacities. Uh, this is because we had already founded before then a network, which I have already informed you, the Southern African GM uh, Detection Laboratory Network, a, a acronym DISANGLE. And from the lessons from that network, uh, countries identified the need for an intervention at regional level to build capacity on LMO detection uh, in the region. So we engaged on a, a project preparatory grant in 2013, as you can see from the diagram, and we were granted a full-size project, which was uh, a multi-country project, which uh, commenced in 2017 and was implemented up to 2023. Based on the experiences of the that project, in, 20, uh, in 2023, we also, 2022, we initiated another project preparatory grant that was looking at now building broader capacities for implementation of national biosafety frameworks in the Southern African region. So I will be sharing with you experiences from these initiatives. Uh, this is just a summary of some of the activities that we did or some of the projects we implemented uh, based on the funding that we got from the DJS of the Netherlands. We looked at biosafety capacity building projects, including capacity building on negotiation skills prior to uh, going for COPMOP uh, negotiations for the Southern African region. We also built capacities on risk assessment and risk management, a number of forces around that issue. We, we collaborated with uh, the African Union and the SADAC in some of those uh, capacity building initiatives. We also did a biosafety socioeconomic consideration um, uh, intervention, um, and we presented these uh, results at uh, the COPMOP in Japan. 
we had access and benefit sharing, regional experience sharing, and we had a number of by safety, public awareness creation and public participation. But those that were specifically uh, designed in form of uh, projects at national level were implemented in Botswana, Eswatini, and Zambia. These experiences were also shared at SEPA fairs. Now, specifically on LMO detection, we had, um, as I initially informed you, under the SANGO, we had a number of trainings on GMO testing or in LMO testing. Uh, in 2006 and 2009. And in 2010, to, between 2009 and 2010, we actually had uh, a capacity assessment also um, funded by DGIS. We assessed a, a number of laboratories, 17 in total, uh, in nine countries across the region. Then in 2013, 2014, we had a second GMO testing. Uh, uh, we had the second assessment funded now by the JEC, and we implemented this in six countries that I will be sharing with you in 11, in 10 laboratories. The 11th laboratory joined later. And already I informed you about the capacity building that followed after the PPG. So you realize that for each of the uh, regional uh, trainings or regional projects we had, we initially had a, a training on. We initially had a, an assessment or an assessment of the capacities and the gaps that existed. So we were led by the needs, as I initially informed you. So uh, this is just a summary of the studies that were implemented. The results are available on our website, and they indicated that. Uh, there was need to build human and institutional capacity in LMO detection in the Santa Cruz. Among other needs, there were more than just the LMO detection, but the focus for the project was on building the technical capacity to equip um, scientists in each of the countries to inform decision making. So this project was implemented collaboratively and it was uh, led by UNEP, uh, of course, funded by JEP. Rain Africa was the lead executing agent, and we worked with governments of Angola, DRC, Madagascar, Malawi, Mozambique, and Lesotho. We addressed LMO capacity buildings, uh, building issues that extended to um, infrastructure support and also human capacity building. It, it also included both the personnel that work in the laboratories, but also those that work in the bicep chain. Uh, across the across the uh, bicep uh, value chain, we worked with technical advisors uh, who were from um, a, a laboratory in South Africa and another lab in Zimbabwe. The outcomes from this project included eleven laboratories that are fully equipped and have acceptable standards of spatial orientation and layout for LMO testing. Ten of those laboratories achieved minimum level of competence. This was um, I, um, this was an interlaboratory proficiency testing. Two rounds were implemented, and ten of the laboratories passed that. Uh, Biosafe chain actors were trained on sampling, documentation, and uh, informing decision making. Uh, opportunities for sharing expertise, lessons, and resources were created um, in the laboratory network that we hope will uh, continue to sustain itself was established. So technical support continues to be supplied to the laboratory networks for countries with BICEF laws in place, uh, informed by uh, in, informing decision-making is, is possible. And I should highlight that of these six countries, not all of them had um, BICEF laws in place. However, they all had some interim measures they were using uh, to manage uh, biotechnology within their countries. Now, the main lessons that we got from the implementation of this project, the main lesson we got was that creating an enabling environment to ensure the benefits derived from capacity building extend effectively to the ultimate objective of informing decision making on bisexual. There was a clear link between uh, the establishment of functional laboratories, LMO testing laboratories, 
and enhancing the process of how decisions are, are, will be made in two of the countries that actually do have laws. In other countries where there are interim measures, there is still uh, a, a, a link needed to ensure that we can be able to assess how these results can actually lead to improved decision making or informed decision making. The second lesson is that the fact that capacity building in by safety actually does have a potential to catalyze discussions within countries. One of the lessons we learned early in the project was in many of these countries, the left hand does not know what the right hand is doing. We are all aware that by safety is multi-stakeholder, multidisciplinary, multi-institutional. And we realized as soon as we started the project that certain uh, institutions in some of these countries were not clearly aware of um, how biosafety itself will be working in their country, what systems have been put in place, and how to link with the scientific, uh, with the science informing institutions. So, in that regard, we felt that the project did catalyze discussions within countries. And to some extent, in one or two countries, these uh, discussions led to an elevation of prioritization, prioritization of discussion of uh, biosafety uh, uh, issues, especially the need to have national biosafety frameworks. Now, in terms of practical lessons in the implementation of the multi-country project, we learned that uh, there is Lauren, need to synchronize. Could you please start rounding up, please? Yes, we learned that there is need to synchronize activities, uh, inter-country activities. Uh, are not easy to manage because uh, you need all countries to be at the same level for you to be able to manage them. So synchronization was vital. Uh, Inter-country training ensured that we saved on, on costs. We, we shared costs uh, across countries. We faced the capacity development into phases. We were able to monitor these phases before moving to the next phase. And there is need for careful sequencing of activities, as I initially said. Also, uh, by doing that, we were able to do step-by-step -step training. There's also flexibility in planning, central pro procurement, which is a, an approach we used in this project, allowed us to leverage on high negotiation power, secure, securing discounts. We initially started with an objective of one lab in each of the countries attaining level one, which is being able to carry out quantitative uh, LMO testing, but we ended up with all the 11 laboratories being equipped because we had the leveraging power and we managed to gain from the savings that we got from it. So economies of scale uh, helped a lot. And also peer-to-peer -peer learning for us was an important lesson that we got. Finally, identifying and addressing common gaps and needs in specific thematic areas can make it possible to focus at a regional level National governments must own the process. As a lead executing agent, our role was to facilitate the process. However, the process needed to be owned by the governments themselves. National level priority setting for GEF funding should consider including addressing target 17 of the GBF. In country coordination, it is, it is a must as the revision of the NB subs is taking place for provision of, uh, um, of the GBF uh, to be aligned. And finally, regional cooperation can maximize on synergies and opportunities for cost-effective sharing of resources. We do have a follow-up project, which we are already implementing, which is also similar to your project that you have just introduced in this webinar, which is looking at strengthening the implementation of national biosafety frameworks in Southern Africa. Three countries are participating in this project, DRC, Madagascar, and Namibia. And the same, uh, uh, Unit UNEP is leading in this project. We are the lead executing agent and working with the governments of the three countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Secretariat Kipabik, the time you gave is we just have 10 minutes more to six o'clock, I guess. Uh, the participants willing to add, so that we can add a bit of time. Tashi, can you consult and give me a feedback? Do we go ahead? Yes, Alex, I think let's go ahead and we can uh, have questions at the end. 
Sorry, Dr. Wipa. Yeah. Uh, I think I so. Can go ahead. Okay, so let's just go ahead. Um, the next set of presenters, please let's take the five minutes so that we can have some time for quick discussion before we close. Uh, I'll call on Baku from Mongolia to give the first uh, presentation or notes for five minutes. So back okay, back thank here. you. Thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. Can I share uh, only five slides? So we are discussing for, uh, the mobile safety in MBTAP as a discussing topic. Over to you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Did you see this is uh, my slide? Is, uh, yes, I can see. I am national bi safety expert for the uh, GBF early action support project. Okay. Uh, now we are working the all related uh, COP decisions, COP map decisions, uh, this, uh, what kind of decisions we are taking for this field. As Mongolia's um, contribution towards biodiversity conservation very effectively, we uh, have uh, two national uh, biodiversity conservation action plan. First is all uh, the uh, 2015 is uh, first uh, phase is finished. First in the surface intervention is achieved 96 percentage. It's very good implemented. After then, uh, we ha have an NBSAP National Biodiversity Strategic Plan. Uh, this is as uh, implementation uh, is same to other countries, not. Uh, good implemented uh, this is ongoing until 2025 now uh, we are uh working there this is decision 15 slash 6. now uh stressed the importance of the following first of all coherence with the national circumstances and capacity for body safety uh also uh we are uh, Propose the integrating by safety and uh, access and benefit sharing. This is uh, our main, fo main focus. Uh, also, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, focusing on Mongolian national by safety should be revised and updated without interrupting uh, implementation. This is continuing to after this, that our works. Now uh, we are aligned uh, between the GVF and national policy. If you see, this is target 17. This is uh, our uh, Mongolian vision 25. Uh, this is long-term development policy of Mongolia. It's including special uh, one target, the 6.2.5. This is, uh, ensure the biosafety capacity building and technical uh, enhancement of technical support in the biosafety. This is already we have. Then uh, we are uh, finishing the uh, goals of NBSAP assessment and alignment with GVF. It is um, now we are already uh, a rapid review of the NBSAP is conducted. That's target 70s. Lion uh, should be working on this. Full screen, right? please. Sorry? Full screen. Can you, Can you make it full screen? Full screen. Oh, sorry. Um, it's okay? Yeah. Did you see? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, yes, uh, this is uh, GBF goals and targets is now. Target 70 is, uh, is NBSAP is uh, empty, red line. Uh, we should be working this. 
uh, after the uh, review uh, review the uh, process, I uh, I propose the uh, one of goal. May uh, we have three main goals. After then, uh, goal uh, six goals. One of them is uh, uh, focused on uh, advantages of the biotechnology, modern biotechnology, ensure the biosafety. Uh, target is uh, required. This is strengthening the biosafety laws uh, and establish implementation procedures across all uh, sectors. Now we are working the uh, this uh, what kind of uh, actions required. Now uh, now uh, now is uh, our team is uh, working on. Uh, capacity build an action plan for the Kastakana Dostwal on Biosafety Mongolia. This field we are uh, working. This is, uh, we have, uh, have a uh, draft. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and um, uh, now is uh, our uh, team is preparing the 5th April. Uh, preparing the uh, one of big meeting and uh, a consultation meeting with national stakeholders yeah that's all uh, we are uh, working uh, now this our uh, by safety alignment with GBF process this is ongoing Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Please note your questions so after the all the presenters we can have a discussion. The next presenter is from the Philippines. The Philippines over to you. Uh, yes, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the part of the world. Well, um, I'm reporting from the Philippines and uh, we apologize that we're unable to invite experts from our Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, that's the department responsible for the development and updating of our NBSOP. So what we can do is uh, to inform our attendees of the efforts and initiative uh, undertaken by the National Committee on Bio Safety of the Philippines and other relevant um, national competent authorities in the aspect of bio safety. So, what are we aiming for uh, in the year 2030 or 2040, 2050? So, the Philippines will focus on the bio safety related provisions of Article 19 of the CBD, with the uh, access and benefit sharing and technology transfer being. Um, the responsibility of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. We understand that the biosafety aspect of Article 19 seeks to ensure that processes and approaches to ensuring biosafety are made available and shared equitably. So in addition to sharing information and developing consistent approaches to biosafety in international fora, the Philippines makes this information available through the Biosafety Clearinghouse. So by 2030, uh, updated biosafety measures and protocol and handling of biotechnology are in place, taking into account new obligations, emerging issues, and new techniques. So how are we going to achieve the 2030 target? The Philippines will continue to implement the comprehensive, robust biosafety regulations that we have in place. So the Philippine regulations uh, governing products of biotechnology provide a robust science-based safety net that helps to ensure products of biotechnology are safe for both the environment, human, and animal health. We have specific government departments which oversee specific regulatory access that align with the mandate that is affected um, in our regulation. And that uh, we are proactively or continuously reviewing and updating our biosafety regulations to ensure that they evolve and are strengthened to meet the new challenges posed by these rapidly evolving technologies. And the Philippines has responded to these challenges by revising or streamlining our regulatory guidance 
for the conduct of field trial, commercial propagation, and importation for direct use as food feed and for processing. Then in 2021, we have developed our policy on new breeding techniques or plant breeding innovations. Moreover, we have an ongoing review of our drop regulation for GM animals, guidance document on GM fish, and we have created a technical working group for to draft the guidance on GM mosquitoes. And uh, we plan to integrate more open public engagement in this process, increase transparency, and align these regulations with the current state of modern biotechnology. So how are we going to integrate Target 17 into the NBSAP? First is by, the, by developing or through the development of a legal framework to support continuous action and sufficient financial resources to implement a strong regulatory and institutional framework on biosafety mainstreaming. We actually plan the NCBP together with uh, the biosafety committees of other departments to propose a program for sustainable capacity building on biosafety and biotechnology based on our 30 years of adoption and regulation of products of modern biotechnology. Then we plan to increase awareness raising activities to enhance the general understanding of biosafety and target a broad range of stakeholders like government institutions, research community, industry, indigenous people, and local communities. Then we also plan to conduct capacity building activities to generate the specific knowledge needed for the proper implementation of biosafety framework and actions on mainstreaming by government authorities laboratories and border control agencies. And then lastly is that is we plan to develop communication strategy aimed at increasing awareness on the critical role of science, technology and innovation to strengthen scientific and technical capacities to monitor biodiversity, address knowledge gaps and develop innovative solutions to improve the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. So thank you. I think that's all that they can that they can report. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, the Philippines. Um, we'll call on India. Uh, Doctor, my apologies if I don't pronounce your name well. Doctor Sinhat Pandey of the National Biodiversity Authority. Sir, over to you. Uh, thank you, sir. Am I am I audible, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I won't take more than two, three minutes. Uh, I just want to uh, lay down what India is doing as far as mainstreaming of target 17 relating to strengthening biosafety regulatory capacity in India is concerned. You all know that India is one of the early countries that, was, uh, uh, that has become a party to Convention on Biological Diversity that was adopted in 1992. In fact, our Biological Diversity Act came in 2002, just after 10 years of the adoption of uh, the, uh, the coming into force of the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity. India took 10 years of negotiation. You will be very happy to know that India's has a, India's Biological Diversity Act under Section 36, Subsection 4, specifically has a reference to regulation, management, and control of risks associated with the use of living modified organisms. Section 34, 4, 36, 4. Basically, this is in reflection of Article 6A and 6b of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Article 6a talks about preparation of, of national strategies, plans and programs, and Article 6b talks about mainstreaming. In fact, if you look at India's journey in terms of preparing uh, NBSAP, we prepared our first generation NBSAP way back in 1999, sir. and then it got updated into our converted into second generation NBSAP in the year 2008, actually. One of the hallmark of our NBSAP is that the action points, what each ministry should be doing. Say, for example, in India, we have nearly 58 to 60 ministries, out of which 25 ministries has something to do with the biodiversity. So what we, what our second generation NBSAP did is that it laid down certain action points that should be, I mean, addressed by each and every department ministry in the country. Today, we have 24 ministries, 29 departments of the central government level who deals with all these things. And what do they do? They basically act upon 175 action points that is very clearly written in uh, the, uh, 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 the in the national biodiversity action plan 2014 in fact i would go uh, i would uh, uh, submit that india is in the process of updating its uh, uh, nbsap in alignment with game gbf all the consultation process is going on in that uh, what i want to tell you is that there are three four actionable points very specific actionable points that are referenced to the 
regulatory process relating to LMOs. For example, uh, uh, Action Fund 134 of NBSAP 2008 talks about review the regulatory process. Uh, uh, Action Fund 135 talks about update national biosafety uh, guidelines. Action 30, uh, 136 talks about uh, I mean, it should be consistent with biosafety protocols which are adopted multilaterally. That means India wants to be in compliance with all that that we do internationally is what is given in the uh, National Biosafety Strategy and Action Plan, sir. And I want to say that this is a new target for India, even in the Kunming material world, this is almost like a new target. Though India is doing a lot of work, India has a long history of uh, doing biosafety related work and in fact, uh, like uh, for Nagoya Protocol, the National Biodiversity Authority is a competent national authority. In uh, in the ministry, we have CS3, the Conservation Survey Division, which looks after the biosafety related measures. CS2 Division talks about, uh, deals with the biosafety. CS3 Division uh, deals with uh, the Nagoya Protocol. Cartagena and Nagoya Protocol is what it means. Basically, sir, what came out of the consultations we held so far with our Indian counterparts, all the state level, uh, 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 union territory level is that there are two elements, sir. Basically, there is a felt need for strengthening capacity uh, for biosafety. That's a very important thing. We, there is a felt need after the COVID-19. Uh, the country needs that it has to, I mean, enhance its capacity, strengthen its capacity. Number two is that at the same time, we must also promote biotechnological research, uh, ensuring that it is uh, safely used. These are the two elements of the target 17 that uh, we understand is very, very critical uh, to our thing. In fact, India has uh, developed uh, not less than seven indicators, uh, national level indicators uh, to address uh, the uh, target 17 of the Kunming Material Global Biodiversity Framework. And in fact, um, I give, I'm given to understand that though National Biodiversity Authority doesn't directly deal with the biosafety related matters, all of our application processing, access to biological resources, deals with the biotechnological aspects in, uh, in a number of ways. For example, all of our Form 3 intellectual property uh, IPR applications, which we call it as a uh, Form 3 applications, deal with our biotechnology related matters where we give a lot of importance to the implementation of Section 36.4. That's what I mean. So basically, we take all precaution that all the regulatory procedures are relating to biosafety are complied with. And I, I'm given to understand that uh, uh, UBCL has already implemented two phases of biosafety uh, projects, uh, capacity development project, and the third phase is uh, ensuring. And I, all I want to tell you is that India is fully committed to strengthen uh, uh, the implementation of bio, uh, bio or safety protocol because India has already uh, in principle committed to adopt target 17 as a whole and we will not be compromising on that aspect. So uh, as and when our NBSAPs are prepared, countries will understand that we have put in place um, a very robust monitoring framework uh, uh, to see how India would be implementing this target. With this intervention, I stop here. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Um, we'll come back for questions. Um, I'll call on Republic of Korea. Hello. Okay. Can you please go ahead? Uh, I'm not sure why my hand is still there, but you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? We the see Korean hand right. oh, We see Korean writing in my hand. 
Yeah. Uh, hello. My name is Wani Kim, and uh, I'm working for the Korean Bicep Clearing House. Uh, so since I have uh, five minutes to present, so I'd like to uh, briefly introduce the Bicep related targets of Korea uh, MBCF. Um, Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. First, uh, I will uh, review the process of building uh, the MPCEP, and then I will explain the targets uh, that are related to uh, GBF target 17. Yeah. Uh, after the adoption uh, of a Kunming Montreal uh, GBF, uh, at uh, COP15 in 22, uh, 2022, the Minister of Environment began uh, conducting various activities to uh, establish the MBCEP uh, in January uh, 2023. So, uh, several seminars, expert meetings, and uh, explanatory meetings were held continuously. and. Uh, a framework for strategy was uh, established uh, as shown uh, on the left. So the National Biosafety uh, Strategy Working Group um, is shown at the bottom of the graph. The working group was held three times to discuss uh, the various topics to be included in the MBCF and uh, made the draft MBCF. The National Biosafety Strategy uh, Establishment Committee uh, comprised of uh, directors from 11 minister, uh, ministries and experts was held three times to review the draft uh, MBCEP um, prepared by the working group and finalized the draft MBCEP. After a consultation with the National Biosafety uh, Biodiversity Committee, uh, comprised of uh, director generals from nine ministries and experts. The MBCEP was then uh, adopted in December 2023 uh, by passing the uh, Council of States. So on this slide, uh, you can see uh, the MBCEP, which was uh, adopted uh, last uh, year. So basically, it was written uh, considering the structure of the Kunming Montreal GBF. Uh, there is a vision and four goals and 21 targets are uh, divided into uh, three categories. So I have uh, translated it for your understanding, but uh, please refer to the content only. Uh, there is no official English version yet. Uh, so among these targets, the target related to uh, biosafety is number uh, 16, uh, safety management of animals and new biotechnology. Uh, it's in red text. So uh, in part two, uh, I will look at this in more detail. So in establishing MBCF target 16, uh, there were three main areas of con uh, consideration. Uh, the first thing is uh, policy consistency. So we considered the, uh, how government policies related to LMOs can be implemented consistently with each other. So uh, to this end, we reflected the fourth LMO safety management strategy adopted in 2023. And we also considered the implementation plan and uh, capacity building action plan for Carotena protocol. The second, uh, the second uh, focused on areas that uh, need to be strengthened based on the experience uh, gained from operating the current uh, LMO regulations. As uh, Korea imports more than 10 million tons of GM agricultural products annually. Uh, Korea has uh, strength in risk assessment and management, 
and uh, detection and identification and information sharing. However, uh, there were many uh, shortcomings in public participation and communication and cooperation with uh, local government, which we wanted to uh, complement. The third, uh, we want to prepare for emerging biotechnologies such as uh, genome editing and synthetic uh, biology. To this end, uh, we are monitoring the international uh, trends and working to uh, develop risk assessment and detection methods for them. So let's take a look at MBCF target uh, 16 in more detail. So uh, there are seven ministries that are related to target 16 and they are listed at the bottom of the slide. Uh, in establishing uh, target 16, we focused on three main areas. The first subtitle is a uh, sub target is to uh, strengthen the effecti effectiveness of existing animal management, uh, safety management. To this end, we plan to develop uh, guidelines related to risk assessment and safety management. We will also revise existing uh, LMO regulations and prepare for uh, ratifications of the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur Supplementary Protocol, which we are not yet a uh, party to. As indicators related to uh, GBF target 17 are currently not set at the CBD level, the indicators for MBCF uh, target 16 uh, are also not set and are all left uh, in draft. The second subtitle uh, is to respond to the risks uh, posed by emerging biotechnologies such as gene editing and synthetic biology. To this end, we will actively participate uh, in international negotiation and uh, develop te uh, technologies for safety management and detection of organized uh, organism derived from uh, new biotechnology and their products. The third sub-target uh, sub is to uh, raise biosafety awareness. We will provide uh, relevant information through various channels, uh, such as homepage, SNS, uh, YouTube, uh, and uh, conduct educational programs and strengthen uh, public participation. Uh, lastly, uh, we will develop uh, detailed annual MBSEP implementation action uh, implementation plan by the first half of this year, and uh, we will have finalized all the uh, indicators uh, for target sixteen. Uh, by the uh, by, the end of this year. So, thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, we will take the last presentation from Bangladesh. So, Haida, over to you. Mr. Haida, are you there? You have five minutes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, sorry, I, I didn't unmute myself. Okay, so it, am I audible now, Alex? Yes, you are. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yes, um, uh, you know that uh, Bangladesh uh, has been 
working with UNEF under UNEF JF Early Action Support Project for updating NBCF of Bangladesh that is under uh, you know Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And uh, obviously Bangladesh will undertake target 17 as one of the target under NBCF. And uh, uh, we are now in the process of consultation uh, for various targets. So uh, And now if we look at, you see, how to mainstream the issues under, say, Target 17 uh, in the revised NDCEP. So we need to look at, say, systemic mainstreaming. Bangladesh has already put in place the legal and administrative measures on biosafety and biosafety systems in place. Uh, and we have got uh, our biosafety rules 2012. We have got also you know, Bangladesh Biological Diversity Act 2017, and also we have got biosafety guidelines. We have got also administrative and regulatory system in place. Um, and a standalone biosafety policy has also been formulated and that is underway to be finalized uh, from the government. And then our national environment policy 2018 also has taken into consideration of biosafety issues. So from the point of uh, systemic mainstreaming, I think we are uh, a bit in a various advanced stage. Uh, then um, in the process of say NBCEP update, that is our third NBCEP, that will be our third NBCEP. Uh, so we will analyze the gaps that are occurring on biosafety measures towards full implementation of NB uh, and national biosafety framework. Then gaps prevailing on legal and technical measures for restoration and compensation, then gaps on implementing the relevant provisions of the protocol, then gap analysis on legal systems in place for restoration and compensation of premise to conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity. And then Bangladesh has also uh, take effort to say access to the Nagoya Kuala Lumpur supplementary protocol. Then issues of individual and institutional mainstreaming. Uh, we have got, you know, already a GMO detection laboratory established under UNEF JF implementation of NBF project. Then we need to enhance further capacity in terms of measures and means for detection and identification of products of biotechnology. We need further capacity in terms of carrying out scientifically sound risk assessment to support biosafety decision making, then capacity building to establish and implement risk management measures, sharing of, of and access to information on potential adverse impact of biotechnology on biodiversity and human health. And then of course we will take into consideration of some crucial issues. Say most important thing in terms of mainstreaming in, in, in Bangladesh perspective, we find that policy level understanding on the importance of fully operationalized biosafety system and capacity building at the institution and individual level. Then scientific level consensus and transparent notions on the introduction of novel technology, taking account of risk assessment and management. Then handling interest of vested groups and commercial interest towards not to be the victim of technological divide or exploitation. So, so uh, I mean, that is all about from my part at this stage because we are updating our NBCF and certainly and obviously we'll take into consideration of target 17 of GBF into our NBCF. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you very much to all the participants and the panelists for your contribution. There were two contributions from Dr. Huja and Doreen on regional and multi-country approaches. And some of the, the two, some of the key issues were funding for joint activities, harmonized approaches, incremental capacity building and restore mobilization. Um, I'll come back maybe when there's time to, to respond to some of the issues. But then uh, we also had 
input from all the participating countries. In summary, each of the countries is at a point in trying to mainstream. Uh, Mongolia has identified the issues and now they are going into the critical issues. Philippines has a framework that they are using. They mentioned some technical areas, including uh, biotech, awareness creation, engagement, knowledge, knowledge generation, and resource mobilization. India, right from the article, right from section 34 of the Biodiversity Act, has clearly identified areas for mainstreaming, including regulation, update, guidelines, strengthening capacity, and safe use are some of the critical issues. Um, Korea has shown that they are also identifying the key areas to be addressed. One, to strengthen the existing LMO safety issues. Uh, indicators have been developed which are in draft form now. They also want to create awareness and look at the risk of emerging new biotechnologies. Bangladesh has also identified issues of mainstreaming. They need to assess capacity and the work is ongoing. So this is a quick summary of the points that were raised. Now I pause for us to look at the questions. There are a lot of questions. I think I'll pick summary of some of them. And then the rest maybe uh, we will work with keep a bit and send a written response to. I believe you have the names of all the participants, so we can send responses to the participants. There were specific ones to Dr. Huja. So let me take those ones first. There's one, Viba, are you there? If you can take the, these two questions. Um, he says, in the context of biosafety, there are specific programs and guidelines on environmental DNA stroke metagenomics. In view of the increasing emphasis on entire biome, in view of entire the question is not in view of increasing emphasis on the entire biome, biome of an um, ecological niche. You can look at the question. Uh, yeah. It's not too clear. Yes. The, yeah. So please write it down, the two, then you can take it. Uh, the okay. second one is about biotech, biotech regulation on animal cloning and genome edited animals. Is there any framework in place in India on release and use of products? So over to you for these two. Yeah, so regarding the first question, you know, we, I would just like to say that as far as the impact on bi microbiome and other things are concerned, there are always, that's an integral part of the biosafety risk assessment. But if you are specifically looking at the technologies for development of changes in, my, uh, in the microbiome, there are efforts towards that also. So like we had the, uh, you know, the... The response from a colleague from the CBD Secretariat, there are, there are several areas being looked at. So these are also the upcoming areas and uh, some of them uh, do fall under the guidelines and for them you need additional considerations. So there is nothing like a very, uh, you know, uh, what you say, this kind of an overarching uh, guidelines. But we can definitely interact and find out what exactly do we do you mean by this and what exactly are you looking for. That's one. And regarding the animal cloning and the um, gene edited animals, we don't have the guidelines as yet. The India brought in the guidelines for genome editing uh, edited plants. But for the animals, uh, the research is like maybe at the initial stages. One thing I just want to say here is that the development of the biosafety regulatory framework, as I said in my presentation also, commensurates with the advances in biotechnology. So when the country has, you know, these kind of products in the pipeline, definitely initiatives are taken. So uh, maybe you can approach the regulatory authorities that you have such products and would like to seek guidance on how how these would be regulated. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question from Sony Tababa, but I will take it up. He says, how many parties of CBD are parties of CPB yet? 
the latter have yet to put in place biosafety policies. In this situation, what gaps have been identified? Are there existing and sustained support to these parties to enable them to put in place biosafety policies and regulations? There are out of 196 parties to the CB, there are 173 parties to the biosafety protocol. Of that, since it's an, this is an Asia region uh, meeting, of that in Asia, the only country that does not have any kind of biosafety instrument officially is East Timor. Each country in the region has at least a draft biosafety framework which they were supposed to build on. So uh, that's the first part. When you are developing a biosafety framework, you do a gap or what they call stock taking assessment. So you identify the gaps and then you build on. Um, in terms of sustaining the support, it depends on funding. The main funding window, window is the global environment facility, but that's not the only funding mechanism. There are bilateral funding mechanisms, including USA, Japanese, and several. Then there are also regional funding sometimes for these activities. Beside that, there have also been some bilateral among countries. And of course, you also can also look at domestic resources for funding. So if need be, we can give additional written response to your question. Um, there were questions about access and benefit sharing, but since this meeting is on biosafety, I think we will not respond to it here, but we can, we can write responses to those who had the questions about access and benefit sharing guidelines of countries like India and South Africa. And uh, there was another one on access and benefit sharing in commercializing biotechnology. I think those ones, we, but that was to you, but I think you can send a written response on that. There's a question to the regional panelists, which I, uh, and if any other person wants to comment on by, the, by a good man, he says, how can we feed 10 billion people by 2050? It is taking a long time. What examples do we have of invasive GMOs or LMOs? None. What are we seeing with weedy species? Uh, this is causing real losses in food and feed. We need to work faster on to get safe food and feed globally. What do you think? So he's just talking about the food situation and the scenario of GMOs and what can be done. So if you have any thoughts, Doreen and uh, Weber and any other panelists, it's over to you. Maybe country representatives would like to say something. Okay. Do they have access uh, to responding, uh, Tashi? Yes. Okay. So then, if any participant also can respond on how do we address the issue of growing population? and ensuring the safe food and feed for the 10 billion people. Any thoughts the person will appreciate? It's a very broad question, so it's very, a bit difficult to narrow in. Are there any thoughts? I don't see any hand. Maybe, maybe very quickly, Alex, I can say something that we, the, this particular, you know, in, as I said, inclusion in the National Biodiversity Action Plan is a very positive step because it brings in like a bridge between, you know, the stakeholders who have been into the biodiversity management and also the biosafety reviewers. Because most of the times what we saw was that these two were, you know, uh, acting differently. And uh, I think Dr. Goodman's, of course, concerns are very right. But mm -hmm. these kind of steps would probably help in, you know, easing out the regulations and more importantly, operationalizing the um, uh, regulations in an efficient manner so that the timely decisions are taken and enabling policies are in place. So at least it has been recognized that these capacities need to be enhanced and that is a very positive step in the in the uh, you know background of the discussions today. 
this would definitely support the development of uh, technology and also the use of these innovative technologies. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I was going to ask a question, but Kibak Public is answering. So uh, that one, I'll not ask that one. I'll just take one or two more and then wind up. There's a question, I think it's, it's to all of us uh, before I attempt to respond. Can individual academicians apply for any capacity building program or funds for biodiversity related projects? Did you get a question? The person wants to know whether individual academicians can apply for any capacity building programs or funds for biodiversity related projects. Any thoughts? Uh, those those BioBridge initiative and all, Alex, if those are the ones where people can directly apply. BioBridge is still that is led by the country, but they can they can liaise with them in developing the concepts. Okay. The, okay. The challenge with individual academicians, sometimes they are sub grants that you can apply. And the reason why sometimes you see some of these bigger funds going through countries that it's a state party responsibility, not an individual. And there are some funds that if you just give and there's no way of tracking, you cannot guarantee that it is used for what it's supposed to be used. What okay. some governments have done is to have a national grant competitive system. So the academicians can write proposals and compete for grants. That is possible. Whilst they are by multilateral, bilateral funds, we then go through government or institutions which can be traced. Uh, so because an individual is very difficult to monitor. So there are different mechanisms, but we can give you further information as well need be uh, because of the global architecture, because money sometimes can get lost. Uh, now to all the four, the, the five participants, this question of you can respond. He says, um, he wants to, the person wants to know the role of the media in these discussions. So from your country uh, perspective, how do you manage media in terms of getting involved in mainstreaming target 17 into the MB subs and Bar City into, into your wider national systems. Any of the participants or panelists, especially the country panelists can give a feedback on that question. Media involvement. Any contribution? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, go ahead. Ah, uh, yes, uh, Alex. Uh, from the Philippines. Okay, so actually here in the Philippines, uh, we do give like uh, orientation seminar or we give um a public seminar for for major person because we know that they can help a lot the the regulatory agencies in disseminating information on biosafety and and, and biotechnology and the regulation. And uh, also uh, in our uh, DOST Biosafety Committee, we do have a member uh, which is uh, who is a, a media practitioner. So that's one way that uh, we can be assured that our um, biosafety regulations are being disseminated to the public. So that's it. Um, I'm going to take the last point myself and then I can hand over to the secretariat to take over from there. There's a question from Nigeria, I believe from one Joseph Inosagi. He says, how can compliance issues as we said target 17 really adhere to us in the GBF, as in the GBF? Josephine, compliance issues is broader than target 17. Compliance is tied to the legal instrument. So there's a compliance mechanism under the convention, and there's a compliance mechanism under the compliance committee of the biosafety protocol. Now, you what the, the means by which they assess compliance 
one is through your national report. So there are, there's going to be the fifth biosafety national report, a report on interventions you have made to respond to target 17. And the compliance committee will review the reports and make decisions on it and make it available to the COP mob. Two, any citizen or any member in the world can raise issues of concern, let's say from country X, and make a formal uh, communication to the compliance committee. Um, as Wazi said, this is not, unlike the bit, this is not a dispute mechanism, but it's a softer mechanism of trying to see how best, if there's non compliance, you would, the system would assist through capacity building to address the issue. So there are means, ways and means in which you can check self-monitoring, reporting, and early warning alerting to the compliance committee are uh, some of the measures. On that note, I hand over to the secretariat to wind up. Thank you very much for staying beyond the two hours for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alex, and thank you to everyone. Now, like we are aware that it has extended beyond the time. We quickly, I would like to request uh, Dr. Zhang to briefly deliver the closing word of thanks. Thank you, everyone. And now we have Dr. Zhang. Uh, dear distinguished uh, guests, esteemed speakers, and dear participants, as our webinar comes to an end, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to each of you for your active engagement, insightful contributions, and interest in integrating biosafety and biodiversity con conservation. Your enabling commitment to this crit critical cause has been truly inspiring, enriching collective understanding of the challenges and opportunities ahead. I would like to extend my appreciation to our distinguished speakers for their invaluable expertise and insights, which have guided our discussions with clarity and depth. I would also like to thank our organizer partner, Biotech Consortium India Limited, BCIL, represented by Dr. Uh, Viva Ahuja and Dr. Alex Zavionep for their support and the project coordinators of the four participating partner countries. Your contribution has been instrumental in making this event a success. To each participant, I express my sincere thanks for your active engagement, questions, and sh shared insights. As we part ways from this virtual gathering, I would like to encourage you to continue engaging with us. We welcome your ideas on how we can further support your journey to implement Target 17. We request you to take a minute or two to provide a quick feedback on this webinar and even share your ideas for collaboration with us and this ongoing project. Thank you for staying with us till the end, despite the extended time of 30 minutes. Once again. More than 30 now. Yeah, more than 30 minutes. Mm. Once again, I extend my deepest gratitude for your participation. Let us continue working together to promote biosafety implementation towards ensuring sustainable use and conservation of biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you very much.